All right. This video is going to be on load balancing with DNS, specifically referring to GSLB or more advanced load balancing protocols you'll see on a, an enterprise product like a Netscaler or an F5. We talked a little bit about how Windows does load balancing, how you can use Windows policy, and realistically you can use those policies for very similar things but the chances of you seeing a Windows DNS server being used in an enterprise or uh, on a broader scale is pretty small. So I like to consider this in the context of more enterprise load balancer products. We're going to talk a little bit about the DNS protocol and what you can actually use for load balancing to, or what's involved in that traffic that uh, the load balancer can use to interpret and make decisions. And then we're going to talk uh, about a few different load balancing methods that you'll see uh, commonly used. So the DNS protocol itself is really simple. You only really have two elements that you can work with to interpret and manage that traffic. Um, first element is you have the query itself. That is uh, the domain you're looking up. So if you're doing an internet uh, if you're on the internet and you're looking at a website, your DNS query is going to be the domain name, www.google.com. Uh, this could be anything, whatever you're looking up, whatever DNS request is getting sent out. The only other element that comes with the DNS request from the DNS um, load balancer's perspective is the uh, IP source or where that request is originating from because there's really no other information that's included in a DNS request that's useful or that can be used to interpret it. So these are the only elements a load balancer has to make decisions on where to send traffic. So any sort of logic has to be based on these two things, the query and the IP address that's sending the query. Paint is not agreeing with me today. All right. So let's go ahead and look at a couple of scenarios. I'm going to pull this up and then bring it over to the side here. There are three basic load balancing methods that you'll, you'll come across. Um, we're going to talk about each one of those and these methods have different names depending on the load balancer that you're working with. Uh, most of the ones I'm going to refer to are based on NetScaler because that's what I'm familiar with but they're pretty straightforward. The first one is round trip time uh, this is basically based on the time it takes, uh, the latency it takes to get a network request between your load balancer and your DNS server. So real quick here, I'm actually going to copy this because a load balancer will have multiple depending on the physical location. Think about the these load balancing in, uh, examples in the terms of a website that is distributed nationally or internationally on a global scale. So we're talking about a Microsoft.com, a Google.com, some web application that isn't just hosted by like a company in one city or state. It's something that's really broad. Because if you think about that instance, um, you don't want client traffic originating from the East Coast resolving to uh, your application instance that's hosted somewhere on the West Coast. You want to keep that local to reduce latency. And that's really where this becomes important and efficient, really for any load balancing method. You're trying to, you want to direct client traffic to the closest available resources. So for the example here, these different instances of a load balancer represent different physical locations, and you want to direct traffic to the closest one. If we're looking at a workflow, you have a client that's looking up a website. Uh, I'm going to reference google.com as an example, even that might not, whatever. That's the example we use. So, Laura Penn says here, client contacts this DNS server. It wants Google.com. The DNS server looks up at uh, information from Google.com and gets directed to uh, one of these load balancers that's handling external DNS for that. It hits the load balancer, and the load balancer now wants to make a decision based on round trip time or the time it takes for uh, network communication to occur between the originate the client that's originating the request and the load balancers that are going to handle that request and handle the traffic connections. So what's going to do is it knows the IP address that originated the request and it's going to 
trigger communication back to that IP address, ping, TCP, UDP. It's going to handle, try a number of different things to get that, um, to determine how long it takes for a connection to handle from that, and also from the other load balancers in its array. So each load balance reaches out, determines the network connectivity, and then the it directs the client, it responds with a DNS query that's going to be fastest. So a DNS query that reflects the device that's closest to the client. In this case, maybe it's this, uh, if the client's on the East Coast and this is your East Coast load balancer, it's then going to direct the client to connect to this one to get to your web application. And that's as simple as it is. It the Load balancers have a number of different methods for trying to get that network latency determination. It could vary, but that's all the round trip time tries to do is what is my closest physical location based just on how long it takes for network communication to happen between that load balancer and the client. The other method, which is kind of the simplest, is using IP-based load balancing. If you think back to our example with the Windows DNS policies, we created a, a client, we specify the client subnets, their server and remotes, we created a zone scope, and then we used a policy to say any client that's in the server subnet gets the server zone scope and gets directed to IP addresses that are in that server subnet. And same with remote. The remote subnet gets a response from the remote zone scope and gets an IP address associated in the same subnet as remote. That You can extrapolate that, and that's the exact same thing that any other NetScaler can do. Essentially what you're doing is you're mapping a client IP address or a number like a whole CIDR or array of IP addresses to physical locations and then you use that mapping of uh, IP address to physical locations to your whatever the closest physical load balancer is going to be. So in this case um, if you have an IP address I'm going to use local IP address just because they're simple. Let's say you have 10, 0, 0, slash 24, and let's just say this represents East US. And that's a subnet. That could be any public IP address that's in East US. And let's say that's where this uh, business occurs. And you have a load balancer that is in I'm just going to make up an IP address. Let's say this load balancer is in West US and this load balancer is in East US. The logic of this is that this method, which is a very common method, is you are creating a database table that basically says I want any requests coming from this subnet to go to my East US load balancer at 10.0.0.5 and I want any requests coming from this subnet to go to my West US load balancer at 10.100.0.5 and oftentimes you'll have other entries too like uh, let's say this is a Midwest server. I want that to also be handled by my West US Netscaler at 10.100.0.5. And then what happens when a DNS request comes in is the DNS request goes out it checks this table and says what is the client address that's sending this request. It maps it to this and this says go to my East US Netscaler so it's going to send traffic to here just based on this table and the logic that you specify. There are databases of public IP addresses and ranges that map to regions and you can just use one of those externally available databases to do that mapping for you and then you have a list of IP, IP ranges and their physical regions and you can just use that to map it to your devices based on physical location wherever you might have them. 
Um, this is a really common practice. It's also used for uh, CDN or content delivery networks if you're using that sort of technology. And this is very, very straightforward. The other component that I was going to bring up that doesn't really have a whiteboard example, but you can use also web application load balancing, which is uh, not really based on physical location, but it does. I bring it up because it uses the DNS name. And what that sort of application load balancing is doing is saying um, you could have multiple sites that are pointing to the same Netscaler. So let's say uh, you have a business website. We've used this example before, portal.business.com. And you have another business website called... Uh, login.business.com um, traffic hitting a load balancer if it says this traffic is portal at business.com uh, the net scaler can interpret the domain that you are using and send it to a different traffic based on that domain so all the traffic is going to the same physical or same IP address externally so let's say this this load balancer is using 10.100.05, right? Publicly, these records still both map to the same IP address. That's a very cheesy way of doing it. So both portal.business.com and login.business.com hosted publicly in a public DNS zone both resolved to the same IP address, 10.100.05. Now, that looks like you have two applications that are hosted the same thing but what's nice about a load balancer is you can point all of your DNS to them and then the load balancer will just interpret the domain that's being resolved either portal or login and send it to the portal app or send it to the login app on the back end based on the domain name itself so it can do web application load balancing from the sense of it is aware of the domain that's being requested and it directs traffic based on that domain. It can also direct traffic based on the URL path after the domain or other elements that are involved in that domain name. That's a big function of load balancing, but that's a it's a little bit different than your traditional DNS load balancing that's getting you to the closest physical location. It's just a method of load balancing that is getting that is directing traffic to the correct application servers behind the load balancer. That basically covers the GSLB element of it. It's pretty straightforward technology when you can think about the fact that the DNS protocol itself doesn't have a lot of information, so it's limited in what sort of interpretation it can do to direct traffic.